All right. So Saturday Night Data Party uh, is coming to an end. And here's why. Um, we've been talking a lot at uh, Trusty Insights about... Uh, <laughs> Chris says you're not a sign is lit up. I know. It's not lit up. And we'll talk about it in a bit. Um, it's coming to an end because of a couple of things. One, this has been a sort of a hobby show. And uh, in our chats at Trust Insights, one of the things we've come up with is like, you know, what if we, it wasn't just a pure hobbyist show? What if it took it a little bit more seriously and made any effort to try and promote it <clears throat> um, other than announcing it it's at some time on Saturday night? So we're going to be doing that. It's going to, uh, the new show will be uh, a few different things. One, more focused on data and analytics uh, and answering questions. Uh, as opposed to just purely uh, data crunching, which is what we've been doing for the last, I don't know how long we've been doing this, this show, about a year now, I think. Um, don't know what the name of it is yet, but the big change for it is going to be, it's going to be during the workday, uh, because something that's data and analytics focused uh, fits better in the workday than it does on a Saturday night when presumably you're doing something fun that is not work. Uh, and I am one of the few weirdos who likes to have uh, uh, playing with data for fun. Other people say, you know, that's really not what we had in mind for a, a fun activity on a Saturday night. So that's going to be uh, the big change. And we'll have some more announcements for that in about a week and a half or two. Uh, if you want to stay tuned to that, I'll announce it here. Uh, but you can go join our free Slack group. Go over to trustinsights.ai slash analytics for marketers. We'll announce it there. So that's point number one. Enough about the show. Two, for those of you who have followed along with Saturday Night Data Party over the last year, you've heard me say, you know, we'll get data from here, we'll, we'll process this, we'll do, we'll do all these, you know, slice, dice, and julienne fries kind of things with it. Data, good, usable data for marketing purposes is becoming more scarce. Um, and this seems to be a bit of a meta trend in marketing in particular, but it's happening in other places too. The latest thing has been for a lot of analytics companies, you know, uh, Cision, Talkwalker, uh, Sprout, and all these companies uh, having less and less access to data uh, and being having more conditions uh, put on what they can do with the data and how they can share it with their users. The most recent uh, email I got was from the, the folks at Talkwalker saying, yeah, we can't buy Facebook's terms of service for the API anymore, um, allow you to download this data. Which makes it really hard to do really good social media analytics uh, if you're not allowed to download you know, broad data. You can only essentially download your own data and nobody else's. That makes things really challenging for understanding what's happening in a space uh, or an industry and things like that. We've seen this happening in other places. You know, the, the most high profile recent example was uh, the CDC <clears throat> having <laughs> the hospital data feed taken away from it. Um, and turned over to Health and Human Services, which then botched it uh, pretty badly. And uh, last we heard, it was slowly being reverted back to the CDC. But a lot of citizen analysts uh, focusing on the pandemic were like, we kind of need this information to know like hospital capacity and things like that and, and, and how well individual states or regions are doing um, in the pandemic. And the data was suddenly no longer available. So it's really important for you in your work to do a couple of things. One, um, constantly be looking for new data sources that can augment the data you already have. Um, trying out different vendors, asking vendors really tough questions like, hey, have you got a hold of this or that? By the way, if you're watching, uh, please leave a comment so I know you're here. Otherwise, this is a faceless number. Um, <clears throat> So looking on the lookout for constantly for new data sources that are quality, right? That are that are vetted and, and good, uh, and becoming something of a data custodian, a curator, a caretaker, a librarian of the information that you have access to. Again, one of the things that people do is they they grab data, they do stuff with it, and then when they're done, they hit the delete key, free up some hard drive space, move along, and as data sources get smaller and smaller and thinner and thinner and our ability to use the data um, get, grows less and less, it might not be a bad idea to have some of that archived 
some of that's stored up someplace. It may not be, you know, you don't need to keep it on your laptop. Maybe you put it in like a secure vault, like a, an Amazon Glacier vault or something like that, where <clears throat> you can get it if you need to. But even like a year and a half, two years ago, when LinkedIn took away the ability for uh, people to get uh, shares of a piece of content, that was a big loss to a lot of folks doing social influencer work. So consider being a data custodian. <clears throat> um, and with your own data, be ravenous about collecting it and generating it and owning it to the extent that you can. Real simple example. If you use a link shortener like uh, you know, Bitly or uh, any of the, the many, many shorteners out there, you don't own that data. You don't have access to the database underneath it. You don't have tracking information. If you run your own URL shortener, which admittedly is a very big technical hurdle to overcome, uh, it's not expensive, it's just complicated. <clears throat> now you own the data. You can see how many clicks a link got. You can see where your clicks came from, sources. You can even push that data into an analysis tool like Google Analytics to make it a little easier to process if you're, if you're not comfortable with the database itself. But you own it, right? It is your data. And frankly, there may come a time when you know, a service or a company like Bitly or whatever goes poof, and suddenly you lose access to that data. If you have if you've been building your own systems, um, you have that to fall back on. One of the things I did recently um, with my own website is I installed Matomo Analytics, which is an open source competitor to Google Analytics. Is it as good? No, not at all. But it's got the basics, and it's a it's a backup, right? If Google Analytics would pff, just gone tomorrow, right, or uh, you know, the Department of Justice pursues an antitrust case against Google and says, look, you break up the whole company and, you know, all these things happen. What if I lose access to my data? What if I lose access to three, four, five, 10, 15 years of information? Right? That's really difficult to replicate. So if you vacuum up the data from Google Analytics, store it locally, and you run a concurrent system like Matomo, that isn't as good, but it's because it's open source and it's hosted on your server, it's yours. You own that data. You control that data. And you can rely on it because no one's going to make the service go away except you if you stop paying for your server. So give that some real thought. The data we care about is becoming more scarce. And it's our obligation as marketers, as business professionals, um, <clears throat> as data analysts um, and experts to make sure that we're continually keeping hold of our data as best as we can while securing it and keeping it safe and stuff. <clears throat> the third and final thing, I think this is a good one to end the series overall on, is there's a lot of noise right now in the world, right? Just in general. There's a lot of uh, noise about everything, and there's a lot of very unreliable data out there. One of the most instructional things that I have experienced the last six months is learning how to properly vet data and analysis in areas where I have no domain expertise whatsoever, namely the pandemic. Right? So for those of you who don't know, I do a, a daily uh, email newsletter where I go through and read, you know, New England Journal of Medicine, The Lancet, Journal of American Medical Association, Stat News, all these different sources, um, reading papers as best as I can. And I put a big disclaimer, I'm a marketer. I am not a doctor. I am not a virologist or an epidemiologist or any of these things, but I'm a marketer and I have the ability to read. Um, but it has been really fascinating growing that skill of, okay, is this credible? How many other sources have referenced this? Is, is it in line with uh, what other credible experts have said? Who are the experts? Who are the people that you know uh, have been thus far proven right and, and proven right over time and time again, uh, who have been in the profession for 15, 20 years and have had many you know, peer-reviewed publications. It's been really instructional. And what ha that's gotten me thinking about is there is not a whole lot of that outside of high-stakes data, right? Does anybody really care if your SEO survey uh, was not done properly? Probably not because nobody's going to die um, if your SEO survey is wrong compared to, you know, a whole bunch of people will die if you get your data wrong about a pandemic, uh, as we've seen in the United States. 
But what if we borrow those skills that we've learned from <clears throat> fact checking the things that we read about the pandemic and apply it to things like marketing or, you know, Gino's commenting here about uh, being active in the, the data for um, real estate. Where, where can you get data? What data can you get? And, and how do you process it and vet it and, and make sure it's, it's real? And there's a tremendous, I think, opportunity for, for you, for me, to take these skills that we've learned during the pandemic and transfer them to our professional lives. When we get uh, the latest study from you know, some company like, hey, here's our brand new social media expert, blah, blah, blah. Cool. Let's read through it. Let's look at the methodology, right? Is there a methodology? Does anyone even publish that anymore? Uh, most papers in, in marketing? No. <clears throat> Who did it? How did you do it? What was the method? Uh, how did you do the analysis? What, what algorithms did you choose? What techniques did you choose? Most of the time, that's pretty slim. If existent at all, um, asking, hey, can I see the backend data? Anonymize to protect the, the, the respondents or the, the, any personally identifiable or sensitive information. Absolutely. Protect people and their identities. But Give me a, uh, would you be willing to make available an anonymized, de-identified data source that we could all look at and go, okay, yeah, in marketing and in business, we don't have peer review. We really don't. And what we've seen in the pandemic is that peer review matters a whole lot. Uh, there have been a bunch of papers that are preprint papers that have not been peer reviewed that later on turn out to be junk, absolute junk. Um, what if we brought back this idea of peer review into the marketing world, the business world, and things like that. What would that, how would that change things? Um, it won't happen. And the reason it won't happen is because there aren't a whole lot of marketers who are um, as skilled with data as they should be. And the reputation damage that will happen to a company for essentially saying, yes, sure, inspect our data set, and then go, ooh, <laughs> look and go, that's not how that works. Um, it's so high that I doubt anyone would be willing to take the risk. But it's an, it's a, it's an ideal to aspire to. Um, Gina asking, uh, how do you gain data for study? <clears throat> for, for real estate, one of the most powerful sources now is uh, the St. Louis Federal Reserve Bank. Uh, they have uh, this art repository called FRED. Um, you can look for it. Uh, they've started bringing in data sets from realtor.com uh, which is super handy aggregated at like the the city level so you can do things check like check housing prices number of sales and things but you can pull these in via their api and process it and build models from it. the value there's not it's not just realtor.com data it's then the universe of all the other data that is in the federal reserve like stock prices commodities uh, household income all this stuff then you can cross-reference that with the Census Bureau data, which there's a service from the University of Minnesota called IPUMS. Um, <clears throat> and again, you can use that to, to understand like a geographic region. What are the characteristics of that region? And start to pull out some really useful uh, insights there. The other thing is, for real estate, one of the most powerful things you can do is uh, match it with things like search data. Like, what are people searching for around, uh, say, you know, houses for sale near me, homes for sale in this place, uh, in, the, in this location. What do the trends look like? And how do those trends correlate, if at all, with Realtor.com data, with economic data, things like that? There's a tremendous amount of opportunity there. But it comes down to knowing what's available, and you have to investigate that a lot, knowing how those data series relate to each other, and then being able to do the analysis um, to see uh, what makes sense and what doesn't make sense. So there's a tremendous opportunity there because a lot of, again, the real estate market, I have a number of friends, including some very, very good friends who work in real estate, and it's not as analytically driven as it could be as an industry. It is pretty far behind. <clears throat> uh, even the big conglomerates, you know, the Coldwell bankers of the world and stuff, still don't really use data all that well. Uh, and they don't forecast with it well. Uh, they certainly don't do any kind of you know, really good inferencing uh, or propensity modeling, things like that. And they may have that like an R&D lab somewhere, but 
it doesn't it never boils down to like the individual agent on the street uh they never have those tools available to them to help make their uh work better uh chip says can't believe i missed the last one yep uh the replay will be in tomorrow's newsletter as it always is uh, it'll be up on my youtube channel but I'm going to close this out by saying thanks for being here. Thanks for watching these as we've done them over time. Uh, and stay tuned for what's next because what's next, I want it to be more useful. Answering questions like Tina's, like how would you tackle this problem? I think those are, those are fun and they're more interesting than just watching somebody type for 20 minutes on a Saturday night. Um, so thanks for being here. Thanks for watching. I'll talk to you all soon. Take care. Want help solving your company's data analytics and digital marketing problems? Visit TrustInsights.ai today and let us know how we can help you.